Welcome, everyone. I'm Seth Witten. I'm the coordinator of the program in French and <coughs> Studies here in the Department of Romance Languages. And it gives me great pleasure to present today's speaker. It's not every day that we have before us a scholar of Dr. McGinnis's stature or a creative writer with his recent successes. But to have both in the same person is indeed quite a thrill. But before I present our esteemed guest, I'd like to take a moment to thank the many people and organizations on campus that have contributed to today's event. In addition to this being co-organized by the Department of Romance Languages and the Irish Studies Program, and Joseph asked me to say that there's a brochure about the Irish Studies Program toward the back next to the bookstore table. Um, Dr. McGinnis's visit is made possible by the support from academic learning communities, the Department of English, the Department of History, the Department of Humanities, Falvey Memorial Library, the Honors Program, the Institute for Global Interdisciplinary Studies, the Office for International Studies, the Lenovo Center for Liberal Education, and the Graduate Liberal Studies Program. This long list speaks to the fact that this event's interest spans disciplines as easily as Dr. McGinnis's life and academic and creative work spans continents. Tunisia, Venezuela, Belgium, Iran, Romania, France, and the British Isles are just some of the dots on his internal map. With as many places of origin and an even greater number of projects, I almost had to remind myself in preparing these remarks that he holds the day job of being a professor of French and comparative literature at Oxford, Sir Wynn and Lady Bischoff fellow in French, and tutor and fellow in French at St. Anne's College. In addition to being a fellow of the Learned Society of Wales and a Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres, the French government recently named him a Chevalier dans l'Ordre des Pannes Académiques. His scholarship includes the volumes Symbolism, Decadence, and the Fin de Siècle, and Maurice Mitterlinck and the Making of Modern Theater, as well as the edited Ontologie de la Poésie Symboliste et Décadente, and his editions of T. Hulme, Riesmans, Welsh poet Lynette Roberts, Mitterlinck, and Charles de Tantigue. His translation of Stéphane Mallarmé's For Anne Flo's Tomb was a Poetry Book Society recommended translation. For Patrick, both academic and creative writing can be forms of inquiry, curiosity, and fulfillment, and his rich and critically acclaimed poetry would seem to bear this out. His 2004 volume, The Canals of Mars, was shortlisted for the Roland Matthias Prize and has been translated into Italian and Czech at last count. Have there been more? There been more? Not yet, no. Not yet. <laughs> okay. And his poetry pamphlet, 19th Century Blues, won the 2006 Poetry Business Competition. His most recent volume of poetry, last year's Jilted City, was also a Poetry Book Society recommended book. Its Blue Guide series of poems simultaneously recall and reformulate Edward Thomas's famous poem, Adelstrop, in my opinion, forming a, forcing us to consider, as much as Patrick's creative works do, what it means to travel through time and space. This is expressed brilliantly in his description in the last hundred days, about we'll talk in a moment, of a Mater D about whom we read, and here I'm quoting, I think of him not as someone who arrived or left, who came and went, but as a being who, like a light, switched himself off and on and off into and out of place. Borders, be they political, linguistic, or cultural, are meant not only to be crossed, but perhaps straddled. In what ways can we, in what ways do we, always, occupy and inhabit several places at once? <coughs> These are just some of the questions that Dr. McGinnis's writing raises. His current projects are far too numerous to list here, but they include a book study entitled Poetry and Radical Politics in the Fin de Cirque de France, of which I've read one part and it's brilliant, a study of Lynette Roberts for Liverpool University Press, and another on British American poet Tom, Gum, and Tom, Tom Gunn, excuse me, entitled Tom Gunn and the Occasions of Poetry. Finally, he has also written and presented radio programs, notably two Radio 3 Sunday features entitled The Art of Idleness and my personal favorite, A Short History of Stupidity. <laughs> Today, we're fortunate that Dr. McGinnis will be reading from his debut novel, The Last Hundred Days, which, is, which was long listed for this year's Man Booker Prize, and which will be published by Bloomsbury early next year. This event, in fact, marks, if I'm not mistaken, the first reading from this book on American soil. As much as the story is anchored in the specific time and place of the waning days of Romania's socialist state, that space is very much traversed, even haunted, by Paris. It's not for nothing that Bucharest is also known as the Paris of the East and Little Paris, echoes not only of that great 19th century city, but also of Charles Baudelaire's Parisian spleen, of André Breton and Philippe Soupeau's late night meanderings through the modern urban labyrinth. 
Poe is here, as are the Beatles, as is Kojak. The title City of Lost Walks that floats through this novel speaks quite directly to the fact that these real places exist through and are even constructed from our losses everywhere, particularly the loss of ourselves through the dissipation of the once sharp edges of our memories. And again, time and space. Sorry. Without ever having been to Bucharest, all of us who have traveled understand what the narrator means when he says that, quote, someone arriving in a new place registers everything except what is important. The air itself is sprung tight, the slightest detail expansive with meaning. As he does so well, Patrick captures an exchange student's first, mo uh, first moments abroad just so, with a language that, like his entire body of work, straddles the line between prose and poetry. Today's reading will be followed by Q&A, after which Dr. McGinnis will be happy to sign copies of his books, which the University Bookstore has kindly made for available for purchase in the back of the room. And I hope that you'll join us for what's left of the lovely food and refreshments as well. So with no further ado, it gives me great pleasure to <clears throat> welcome to Villanova, Dr. Patrick McGinnis. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's extremely hard to follow such a wonderful and generous-minded um, introduction. I'd like to thank you all very, very much for coming and also um, to the University of Villanova for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> so Seth quoted a line about how somebody arriving in a new place registers everything except what's important. Well, I, I've, I, maybe I'll revise that now because I arrived here on Saturday and I've walked around um, Philadelphia and New York and Villanova and I've at least registered two things mainly, the um, openness and generous mindedness of the people and the extraordinary quantities of food available wherever you turn, some of which I've availed myself of already. Um, but I think those are important things and I've registered them. Um, I <clears throat> what I'm going to do this afternoon is read from my novel, which as Seth um, said was, is called The Last Hundred Days and it's a, it's a book about, it's a very partly thinly autobiographical book about the last days of communism in Romania where I lived um, and a few poems from my two collections of poems, of poetry. Um, I am interested in cities, yes, I'm interested in maps and I'm interested in the way we plot our ways through, through life but also through our emotions and through our minds and our consciousnesses and our unconsciousnesses. I think that our lives can be thought of as cities um, <clears throat> with paths that sometimes lead somewhere, sometimes don't, roads that we always think we'll be able to return to but certainly turn out not to be there. It was like a constantly remodeled city um, and I found this when I lived in Bucharest and I was there between about 1986 and 1988 and this was the time when Ceausescu, who is the name of the communist um, president, dictator, was essentially destroying this great city. Bucharest was a wonderful, evocative city, very francophone, very European, and um, extraordinarily beautiful to look at. It had its tastes and its smells, its wonderful old streets, great, graceful, broad avenues, wonderful vistas, beautiful sunsets, little parks, places that you would be able to see for miles around and other places that would spring up on you, you know, a, a wonderful sort of side street would suddenly appear in front of you. So it was like being in a dream. But what was happening was that communism, which constantly wants to remake the past as well as the future, um, was destroying large swathes of the city. Um, it was not uncommon to get up in the morning and find a house or a street or a church that you knew, that you'd been to, that you'd orientated yourself by, had suddenly been knocked down and there would just be rubble. And that was an extraordinary experience and it became a metaphor for all sorts of things in my head. And for about 20 years after I left Romania, <clears throat> I had this recurring dream that I was walking through Bucharest and trying to find my way through the city that I once knew and everything had been replaced, replaced and knocked down. So an old church had been flattened. And this dream um, recurred, I would have it once or twice a week. And since this book appeared, the dream has now disappeared, um, which is great, but I, 
I kind of wonder what it's left room for, what, are, what other terrible, tortured pieces of my unconscious will now step in to replace it. But um, this book was an act of catharsis about that, and it's about memorial, I suppose, how you remember things. It looks like it's about communism or capitalism, and it isn't really. It's about people and places and um, how we make, make maps, really, of our, of our lives <coughs> and of our memories. So that was, that was the novel. My last book of poems was called Jilted City, um, and the idea of the city comes back then, but I wasn't conscious of that at the time. I took the line from a quotation by a French poet called Henri Thomas, where he says, Oh, mémoire, cité trahi, oh, memory, abandoned or jilted city. Um, and I thought that is what memory is. Again, it's an abandoned place. You know, you think that you're holding your memories to you, but in fact, you're, you're constantly betraying them, spending them, giving them away. Um, you know, we think of ourselves as being anchored by our memories, but really it's our job to anchor the memories, but we can't do that. And this is the abandoned city. And that book is dominated by some very melancholy poems about loss, loss of people. Um, but it's very difficult to talk directly about the loss of people. So you talk about the loss of places or former selves of your own, like childhood, which is an elegy in itself. So that said, it's not going to be a totally depressing afternoon that I will treat you to. Um, but it, it will, I hope, be reflective in parts. <coughs> So what I thought I would do initially was read from the beginning of my, my novel. One of the things about living in, com in Romania, um, the last days of communism, was that things were extremely boring. I mean, but they were boring in a very particular way. I realized that in the West, we have an idea of boredom as just a kind of emptiness that we could fill any time we wanted. Um, boredom in totalitarian places where action means something, where what you do has consequences, isn't experienced as a blank. Um, and I remember one of the first things that happened to me um, when I got to Bucharest, surrounded by police, um, in these great sort of empty avenues, <coughs> was, was that I was bored, but it wasn't pleasant bored. It was tiring, exhausting, nervous bored. And so I began my novel with an analysis of boredom, which is, again, extremely unpromising and perhaps a high-risk strategy for someone who wants to make it in the world of fiction. But um, you can see what you think. <clears throat> Chapter 1. It strung you out and stretched you. It tugged away at the bottom of your day like shingle scraping at a boat's hull. In the West, we've always thought of boredom as slack time, life's lift music sliding off the ear. But totalitarian boredom, that's different. It's a state of expectation, already heavy with its own disappointment. You saw it all day long in the food queues, as tins of North Korean pilchards, bottles of rock-bottom Yugoslav slivovits, or loaves of potato bread, reached the shops. People stood in sub-zero temperatures or in unbearable heat, and they waited. Eyes blank, bodies numb, they shuffled step by step towards the queue's beginning. No one knew how much there was of anything. Often, you didn't even know what there was. You could queue for hours, only for everything to run out just as you reached the counter. Some forgot what they were waiting for or couldn't recognize it once they got it. You came for bread and you got Yugo Rotgut. The alcoholics jittered for their Rotgut and they got pilchards or shoe polish. And it wasn't by taste that you could tell those two apart. Sometimes the object of the queue changed midway through. A meat queue became a queue for Chinese basketball shoes. Israeli oranges sagged into disposable cameras from East Germany. It didn't matter, because whatever it was, you bought it. Financial exchange was just a preliminary. Within hours, the networks of, bar of barter and black market would be vibrating with fresh commodities. It was impossible to predict which staple would suddenly become a scarcity which humdrum basic would be transformed into a luxury. And even the dead were feeling the pinch. Since the gargantuan building projects began in the early 1980s, marble and stone were requisitioned by the state for facade work and interior design for public buildings. In the cemeteries, the graves were marked out with wooden planks, table legs, chairs, even broomsticks. Ceausescu's new palace of the people could be measured not just in square meters, but in gravestones. 
It was surreal, or it would have been, if it wasn't the only reality available. I had arrived full of the kind of optimism that, in retrospect, I recognise as a sure sign that things would go wrong. Not for me, for I was a passer-by, or, more exactly, a passer-through. Things happened around me, over me, even across me, but never actually to me, even when I was there, in the thick of it, during those last hundred days. So obviously the narrator doesn't know it's the last hundred days, but he arrives and he finds this strange world, and he finds that it's a world that is entirely corrupt, totally corrupt. But it's an exciting corrupt world, um, because corruption is quite interesting. Corruption has its own, it has its own laws, it has its own routines, it has its own hierarchies. Um, corruption creates a kind of sub-society. Um, and what corruption also does, and it certainly did in the communist system I lived under, was that corruption was the only way you could actually get and do the things that you, could, that you weren't able <coughs> to get and do in the real world. And everyone was corrupt, everybody. Um, it didn't matter. And in fact, it was the people who weren't corrupt who really worried you because it suggested that somehow they weren't human. Um, everyone's corrupt and corruptible at some point. Um, and like all kinds of corruption, it becomes incredibly kind of textured and interesting. Um, it m gives the world a kind of darkness, a kind of shadowiness that, um, that was a wonderful contrast to the obvious lies, as it were, of state propaganda, of communism, and so on. Um, one of the things about corruption was that it it created a new kind of currency because the local currency wasn't worth anything because you couldn't buy anything or you could you could go to a shop called monocom which um which basically sold one kind of everything well actually not everything not even everything but everything there was came in only one variety so you had a camera called camera toilet paper called toilet paper and sometimes i think actually that the west could do with spending a few years just with monocoms but um that's a different question um, and because you had monocom, and because you had only one kind of anything, um, what people used to do was import. They used to, um, in order to get basics like <coughs> chocolate, um, milk, um, things to smoke, things to eat, meat, you had to barter, you had to sell services, you had to do stuff. And that went from every kind of prostitution available to um, the selling of cameras, or the selling of books, or the selling of whiskey, or the selling of cigarettes. And one of the things about that is that the corrupt society produces its own hierarchies and its own structures. And I was quite fascinated by that. And one of the things I also <coughs> discovered about corruption is that you, just because you're corrupt, you don't have to be bad. Because if everyone is corrupt, um, everything is also absolute. And... Um, what I noticed about all of the friendships that I had was that they were all, at some level, founded on truth. We liked each other, people liked each other, um, they were sincere, but they were also founded on certain kinds of lie, because the Romanians that you knew were legally obliged to inform on you within, I think it, the rule was the seven-hour rule. Um, after every meeting, you had, they, had, they then had to go to a to the local police station and give a full account of the discussions that they had with you, what you talked about, what you'd done. And so you were in this strange situation where people you knew and in some cases liked and in some rarer cases loved were also people who were informing on you as you were indeed informing on them. And what fascinated me was how human beings managed to still have normal relationships in spite of all of that. Um, over and above all of these things People still want the same things. Um, normality, a kind of normality. And um, we managed to have that. And certainly the Romanians that I knew managed, despite that extraordinary violence that the police state does to you, they managed to be themselves and they managed to be normal. But in this world, of course, everything means something else. Everything has its double. Um, and then I began to think in terms of doubles. So the truth would have its double as a lie. The old city would have its double as the new city that Ceausescu was building. The 
Um, a tr genuine relationship would have its double in a fake relationship, and so on and so forth. And then, by the end, you, you realize that everything is lived through a system of doubles. The world above was also had its double underneath. The world, the official world, had its double as the world of corruption. <coughs> And one of the things that happens to my character is that he gets drawn into the doubles, endless doubles, doubles, triples, quadruples. He begins to find truth of, ki uh, of sorts in a world where in order to reach the truth, you don't find it straight on. You have to go through a series of lies in, which, in order to get there. So the truth is reached by, I suppose, what theologians would call the via negativa. You exhaust every lie until you find the truth. You exhaust every wrong emotion until you find the real emotion. <coughs> you exhaust everything that looks like love until you get to love itself, and so on. <coughs> and I think that's probably true everywhere. We just don't know it. And one of the things he does, he meets a character who is called Leo. And Leo is an English lecturer at the University of Bucharest. And Leo began, he arrived in Bucharest a few years back, writing a book about the city, a guidebook. But he finds that the city is being destroyed faster than he can actually write about it. So his book ends up being this strange kind of fantasy about the lost city, the double of the real city. So the city is half imagined and half real. <coughs> and this is the, the character Leo, who is, um, who, as it were, the, the driving force of the novel. <coughs> In his spare hours, between days of teaching and nights of deal-cutting and black marketeering, Leo worked on his book about Bucharest. The longer I knew him, the more frenzied his pace of writing became. He couldn't keep up with the city's obliteration. The place was coming down faster than it could be described. In the eight years he'd been here, he'd watched nearly a quarter of the old city go down. Churches, monasteries, private houses, public buildings. It survived in guidebooks and memoirs only and in the trove of notes and photographs that lay heaped on Leo's dining table, waiting to be turned into prose. <clears throat> but the prose itself went from topical to commemorative in a fraction of the time it usually took for such transformations, months, weeks, sometimes days. <clears throat> Leo had begun writing a practical guidebook for a travel company, but he'd finished up composing an urban elegy, a memorial to a place gone or going at every cobble, every cornice. Against the wall, a metre-square map of Bucharest, stuck with lines and clusters of coloured pins, was attached to a cork board. The red pins, <coughs> the red pins, he said, are the walks taken, the blue pins are the walks yet to take, the black ones are the walks you can't take anymore, the lost walks. The city of lost walks, is that really your title? I asked. The finished sheets of his book lay piled on his dining table, indexed. Cartier by Cartier, I read the names aloud, Dorabantz, Dudesht, Herestrau, Lipscani, while Leo sought out the pages that described where I lived. <coughs> he handed me a typewritten sheet with lines and arrows in red in the margins, and this is what it said. <coughs> Beyond Alea Alexandru, the Ottoman artisans' houses are lined up in a row, their tanneries and stores across the road, and further down Strada Rabat. Queen Marie of Romania would visit the tradesmen here in disguise on her frequent incognito trips around the city. A small mosque to the east has Bucharest's oldest minaret and dates from the late 16th century. Nearby, a hundred yards to the west, the church of St. Cyril and Methodias faces the Lutheran Kirche that serves the German community. The building next door, the 19th century Hotel Particulier that once belonged to the Casanu family, now houses the Union of Artists." Unquote. But I knew of no Lutheran church, and though I had not visited every street and square, I recalled no spires mounting the crowded, crane-ridden skyline I saw from my balcony. As for the mosque and the Ottoman workshops, I couldn't even place where they might once have stood. The nearest I'd seen to a minaret was the brick chimney of the clinic incinerator. For people like Leo, However, the city's, the city's redesign had not succeeded in obliterating the place as memory of itself. The old town ached in him the way the lost limb aches on amputees. 
With his racketeering money, Leo bought books and paintings and icons. He salvaged from the wrecked buildings, buying job lots of furniture and art from the demolition men, going out with the lieutenant in a van camouflaged as an ambulance and stripping condemned buildings before the wrecking balls and bulldozers arrived. What he didn't want, he sold on or he exchanged at a mysterious place I'd never seen and which was called simply Shop 36. It was better known by its more evocative, poetic nickname, Le Magasin de l'Ancien Régime, where the detritus of old Romania found its way to be sold to tourists, gangsters, party hacks. <coughs> His flat. Leo's flat had become the city's hidden visage, like a backwards portrait of Dorian Gray. It was as if the place disappeared around us, but Leo's apartment grew in compressed splendour. These places, he said to me one night, pointing at a tiny glass-covered arcade of shops in Lipscan, these places, they're as much under threat as the rainforests or the Galapagos. A double row of tiny workshops, each with a different trade, twisted to the left, then opened onto a regimented precinct where all the shops had numbers. Six years ago, there was a stone courtyard with a fountain and a street theatre where the city's musicians had improvised. Leo claimed he could still hear them. He put his hand on my arm. Listen, he said, closing his eyes. At these moments, he would go into a kind of trance, tuning into something that for him was still going on. His belief in the continued existence of lost places was not just a way of thinking. So, <clears throat> as the novel progresses, and it does progress, but quite slowly, um, you get a, a sense. What I wanted to do, really, because the Bucharest that I had experienced intensely was gone, was gone for two reasons. One, it was being knocked down, but for more intimate reasons, I had gone from it. And most of what I remembered, I'm sure, was exaggerated. I exaggerated the place's beauty. I exaggerated its, its strangeness, its poetic nature. But I think um, I never went back to Bucharest because I thought it might actually interfere with the image I had in my mind, which I'd set such store by, of a city that I, that I loved and had been kind of impressed by, that I'd taken as a metaphor for all sorts of things. Um, and what happens is that um, <coughs> communism begins to crumble, but it begins to crumble in ways that I suppose when I was writing the novel I thought was, were quite kind of irrelevant. I thought to myself, who's going to want to read a novel about the end of um, a rotten, corrupt regime? Well, I don't know, still don't know the answer of that, but fortunately the Arab Spring came to my rescue in terms of topicality and relevance. And I realized that Rotten regimes collapse in the same way all the time. It's like Tolstoy talking about happy families being happy in the same way. Um, but unhappy families are always ha unhappy in their own way. Um, and so I was quite struck as I was watching, especially most recently, the Gaddafi <coughs> um, regime collapse, of how much it reminded me of what I remember of the fall of Ceausescu. Now, I can't. I don't know how many of you, looking around, not many, were alive, let alone conscious, when communism fell. But it was, it was a very strange thing. What you had was a series of smooth revolutions. Um, East Germany, Czech, Czechoslovakia, um, Poland. Each of them fell in their own way, in, in what seemed like a kind of characteristic way, too. The, <clears throat> the systems ran out of steam. All the people administering the systems realized that there was no future for them. But Romania did it differently. Romania spent a week, ten days, um, in absolutely murderous internecine warfare, which produced some of the most shocking images of the, um, of the end of communism. Does, has anyone seen any of these images? You've all seen images of the Berlin Wall falling, you know, the, this great sort of... And that's right, we're fed this image, of course, of communism falling in the way that it has to, with a kind of strange inevitability. And we see these happy people clambering over the wall, chipping away at it. Um, but the images that we don't really like looking at are the images of um, people being strung up with piano wire, the last minute massacres, snipers, um, and that strange, very theatrical execution of the Ceausescu's. Anyone seen those images? Yeah, I mean, they are, 
they are extraordinarily uh, disturbing images, not just because it's the execution of, of people um, that at some level we, regardless of what we think, we don't necessarily want them to be executed, but we, we might see why they had it coming. What, what is very strange is their trial. They're put on trial, they look small and um, insignificant, and their trial becomes this kind of travesty of justice before which they are executed. And I remember, given that I missed the revolution, though people I knew were involved in it, I remember sitting in my student room, much like you and probably not much older, looking at the Romanian revolution and feeling, you know, I was there 18 months ago, I was here, I was there. I was in these streets, I was watching this. And I felt two things, really. I felt, I felt cheated because we all want to be at the centre of events. It's only much later that we realise that events have no centre. But I didn't then. I, I thought that there was a centre and I thought this was it. And the other reason was that part of me was absolutely desperate to see the Ceausescu's <coughs> receive what I believed they had coming. So I sat down and watched their trial and then what we didn't see until much later was the, um, you can see it on YouTube, um, their execution. <clears throat> and it was not unlike the, the way people like Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi um, finished up. And I became fascinated by why it is that these people can't see it coming. Everyone else can. There must be something that cuts them off. Some fundamental block that grows and prevents them from seeing what everyone else can, can see. And regime change throws up these great symbolic images, you know, Gaddafi with his extraordinary, extraordinary mad um, wardrobe of clothes, uh, Mubarak being stretched in to his trial in, in Egypt, Saddam Hussein's last moments and so on. Something stops them. There's like a block between them and history, even though they've had all this power. And if you look at the, the collapse of the Romanian regime, um, you see all of these typical um, regime change revolution narratives. You see, first of all, that all dictators have appalling taste. Um, they, have, they have terrible clothes. They have endless amounts of sort of gold bath taps, expensive trash, because they're kind of on a layer. They're on a kind of cushion of, of trash, um, expensive trash. And perhaps that's what stops them from seeing things. But if someone wanted to do a really interesting PhD, they could do a lot worse than do something on the sociology of dictators' homes because you would have an, an extraordinary subject, really. But it's a kind of architecture of alienation. You know, I'd lived in this country where you couldn't even go and buy um, a loaf of bread reliably, let alone a cheese steak the size of a shoe. Um, <laughs> and, yet, and yet these people were living with 46 palaces all permanently staffed and so on. Amazing, an amazing alienation from reality. And so at the end of my novel, and it, the good news, it does end, um, the, the end of my novel is about the, this absolutely terrible, bloody conclusion to the system. Um, and the last bits that I will read um, from the novel are about, <coughs> about this. And this is the, the narrator is standing there uh, watching, watching the first news come through. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Christmas Day for the Ceausescu's ended early because that morning they were executed against a wall and their not yet dead bodies were finished off by handgun. By five o'clock, Fillimore and I were watching film of the trial on television. It's only the Ceausescu's we see. They're sitting at a small table in the Targoviste bunker. They were defiant to the end and they're strangely tender in their small proprieties. It's always the small proprieties that stick in the mind. Perhaps it's because they seem to take death's measure and, for one brief moment, to square up to death. It's the way she buttons up her coat and juts out her chin decisively. The way he strokes her hand, smooths his hair, puffs out his chest. 
Is it my memory playing tricks? Or does she, minutes before the end, wrap a scarf around his neck? You'll catch a cold, she says. She's disorientated and in terror. Asked how old she is, she replies, you shouldn't ask a lady her age, this, no more than half an hour before they're shot. Every dictator's trial has one of these moments. Unexpected dignity, perhaps, or fastidiousness, when the bloodlust that's been stirred up in us begins to waver. What is he saying? There are subtitles, but it's just a, a desolate life and death patter. I am the president, he says. I do not recognize this bandit court. I will answer to the people and to the people only. She says, we made you, we looked after you. Is this how you repay us? This is nonsense. The Romanian people love us and will not stand for this coup, she shouts. Bravery? Or is it just fantasy outlasting its relationship with reality, like the last note of a symphony hanging in the silence that will swallow it up? They are found guilty of a range of crimes, from starving their people to, only, to owning too many pairs of shoes. At one point, their defence lawyer has to be reined in by the prosecutor because he's shouting abuse at them. Their accusers are kept out of sight, and their names, when either Elena or Nikolai Ceausescu mentions them, are blanked out of the subtitles. We're, uh, we aren't supposed to know who they are. One of the voices is Manea's. I recognise it. It's all finished now. The camera pans across the corpses. Their faces are intact. The entry wounds are tidy. On the other side, the exiting bullets have ripped through their skulls and the backs of their heads flap open like hoods blown off in a gale. She lies across the pavement where he has died, while he has died on his knees with his torso and head thrown back. Someone opens their eyes and checks their pulse. There's a sudden jolt and we see an irrelevant snatch of blue sky as the cameraman loses his balance. A perfect azure expanse. It's empty, weightless. Then he steadies himself, stepping across first the one body, then the other. The close-up of their hands, parted where the bullet's force tore them away from each other's clasp. The clothes of the dead are what stay in the mind, not their faces. She has a shoe missing. Where is it? His astrakhan hat is by his side. Her bag, which she kept until the end, is still lodged in the crook of her elbow. <clears throat> so the narrator watches this and, perhaps against expectations, decides that it's time to go back to Bucharest um, because he feels that he still has some sort of a life there. What the book also suggests um, is that a lot of the time regime change isn't, is more about regime than change. That is to say that the people who you get rid of tend to be um, exactly the same as the people who replace them. And that's certainly true in Romania and it may well be true in many other places where we've had regime change. There's not enough change, too much regime probably. Anyway, so that's, that's the novel. And um, it's a novel about a young person in an impossibly strange country that he probably shouldn't have gone to, um, but from which he got a large amount. And I'll finish with a couple of poems. Is that okay? And then I can take some, sure. some questions. So, um, <coughs> Most of what I write, I think of as being descriptive. Um, because I think that when you describe one thing, you're also describing endless numbers of other things, too. Um, and being of a morbid disposition, I'm fascinated by the way when one writes a lot about life, one's, in fact, writing about death and vice versa. And I didn't realize this, and I wish it wasn't the case, but actually most of the poems that I've written seem to be about death. The novel that I've written is about death, lots of them, <coughs> lots of specific deaths, as well as death in its um, widest sense of the term. But I think that literature is there to mark out absences, and it's also there to give you something instead of the absence. And an example of that Literature is there to make things happen that otherwise wouldn't happen. I'm not interested in describing what also already exists. That's a tautology. Um, there's a great French poet called Malarmé, who uh, the Frenchists among you will know about and will rightly be afraid of because he is very difficult. 
But one of the great things that he says, and it's, it is worth reading him, is he says, you know, the world already exists. What's the point in describing it? Our job is to understand the connections. And that's what I think we should be about. So here's, here's one connection. Um, as my first, when, when my, well, it's a poem called Father and Son, and it's about, it's about that strange feeling which I had, and I hope, I hope not many of you have it, when um, you're expecting your first child while one of your parents is, is terminally ill, and you're working out how the life that is ending might meet the life that is about to come, and whether they'll cross. And because life is often not very generous about these things, it gets denied to you. So you turn to literature where it might be made to happen. And so this poem takes as its central conceit um, the person who is about to arrive and the person who is about to go being like two letters. One is about to be sent and the other one is about to be received and they will never meet and they don't touch. The only place they will touch perhaps is, is in the letterbox somehow. That's the conceit. It's called Father and Son in memory of my father and in welcome to my son. In the wings there is one who waits to go on, and another has seen run who waits to go. I would like to think they met, if not here, then like crossed letters touching in the dark, the blank page and the turned page, the first and the last, shadows folding over and across me in whom they're bound. <clears throat> this is another poem. Actually, quite a lot of them are a bit depressing here in this one. Um, but I had fun writing them. That's the main thing, isn't it? Um, so this is a poem called No, and it's, it's a kind of backhanded tribute to my Irishness, such as it is. Uh, my father was from an Irish community in the north of England, and um, northern Irish by, by origin. And one of, the, one of the legacies of having a father who's half Irish, at least half Irish, but didn't want to be at all, is that you'd have a very negative legacy, which, as anyone knows, you rebel against by trying to turn it into something positive. If your parents give you something positive, you have to turn it to negative. Fortunately, my parents gave me only negative things, so I, I have a lot of <laughs> positive things to offer. That's how I... Um, rebelled. It's called No, it's about the Northern Irish peace process. It's about the numbers of people that we knew who wanted to vote against it. It's called No, and it's about Belfast, incidentally. No, the police station seamless, riveted and sealed, foreign as spacecraft, still the place grows around them. Prams, like hot-wired cars, lie empty on the grass. Past tricolored curbstones, girls push and invisible winds, sky the colour of armour, and the air muscular with battle. The slow quotidian burrs in these hives of negativity. King Billy and Princess Di rule their dystopia of rangers clubs and chip shops in the here and now, the present tense with counterflow, facing time head on, as walls face winds, coasts face off the seas, and they lose so slowly that it feels like winning. A poem called The White Place, self-explanatory. Whenever somebody says this poem is self-explanatory, it's usually for a, a cue for them to then explain it <laughs> inexhaustibly <coughs> and exhaustively. But I won't do that. The White Place. One afternoon, we watched a program on near-death experiences. A woman tunneled back through life to what came after and was reluctant to return since her life paled beside the white place she'd been pulled back from. Now she lived between the two, nostalgic for the afterwards she'd died into. The next day, dozing on a stationary train, you woke and asked the question that had woken in your mind as if it were on mine. The white place, you asked, will anybody else be there? I didn't know, I hadn't thought to ask, no one had. If in the white place we'd be alone or with other people. You asked about your friends, if the best of here translates to there, or if we leave as we come in alone. I still don't know. I think that we are not alone. 
I think it less for your sake now than for my own. Um, I think the last poem. Um, the other half of my life was spent in Belgium, um, and I'm, I feel, if I feel anything, I feel Belgian. But like all Belgians, I'm only half Belgian, because as you, as you may know, Belgium is a kind of split state, split between two languages and two communities, and two geographical areas. And um, a lot of my um, childhood was spent traveling through this country that uh, was partly mine and partly wasn't, and I only half belonged to. And um, that, that for me is the, the abandoned city, as it were, the child that I might once have been. Um, so this is a poem called French, which is the language I was mostly brought up speaking. French. Teaching it to my children, I think of it now as my mother's tongue, if not anymore, my mother tongue. It's freighted with a kind of loss hers, mine, and what she lost as she passed it on to me, continents away from where she started, shot through with gaps, mothballed and moth-eaten at once, the smell of preservation neck and neck with the smell of death. Lying for years in the cellar, it fattened up, grew milky, slow, echoed in my mouth as in a tunnel of its own disuse. Then, like drinking from the source, came our annual summers in Bouillon, where our belgitude rose up in us, like the damp behind the wallpaper in the house that stayed unused nine months out of twelve, its empty rooms, lost cupboards, the stored-up junk piled up so long that each forgotten item now dovetailed into the next, a perfect carpentry of abandonment. It was the tongue and groove of unused words, life in suspension, ready to rise again like dust in the backdraft from a closing door. There's something in it when I use it here brings back those moments when, mid-play, I'd nip indoors for a piss or for a sandwich. And when I came back, the other children were all gone, the courtyard empty, the toys back in their boxes and the sky already crossed with evening. There's something brings back the knowledge, always wrong but always knowledge, that there would never be another time than this, this ending tainted perpetuity. And now my children taste it the empty courtyard French I used to speak. They push their tongues along the language, and as I hear their words snag, I hear my own again, and wake from that recurrent dream in which I'm always waking up, and break off that aborted first line of my story, which I'm always starting, that I'm much younger and still Belgian. Since we're in an elegiac mode, I'll finish with a um, symmetrical elegy, L'air du temps. Um, L'air du temps is a French perfume, um, which is the perfume of my mother. And every time I smell it, um, I have this double sensation, which is both of loss that is immeasurable, essentially, but also intense presence. L'air du temps, tracing her, her <coughs> sorry, l'air du temps, Tracing her perfume link by link of vapour through the crowd to where she's not, to where her scent expends itself in air. I pass through as if the ghost was me, not her. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you give us some questions? Yeah. 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 Uh, Yeah, yeah, I mean, it influences really how I perceive everything because 
being brought up in a bilingual um, environment, um, I associate, and because lang French was the first language that I learned, it was the language that I expressed myself in childhood with, um, in, spoke to my mother, my mother's family. And so when we left Belgium, when I was, very, when I was quite small, um, we seemed to be carrying, everything that I had was carried around inside French and inside that relationship. Um, so I always associate French, which I'm less, I'm less fluent now because, um, I, I mean, I am fluent, but I, I still find French to be the language in which emotional stuff gets expressed, whereas English was the language which was the acquired language. And when, the moment you're thinking about those two parts of yourself as separate, the space between becomes the place of, of loss, in a sense, and the place of loss is always what, effect, what affects everything that you see. So yes, yes, it's, uh, it's an ongoing relationship I think I have with the, that language and with, with the idea of loss. So it's the other side of this multilingual, multicultural background and I was just wondering in terms of poetry, who, you're, you know, who, who most influenced you in terms of French poets you've translated or Irish poets or some other? Yeah, um, well, I think that my, I was most influenced by feeling very estranged by language. I think, I don't know if it's true for fiction. I think with fiction, you have to be much more comfortable with language. But I think for poetry, you need to be you need to be slightly at odds with, with language anyway. You have to be trying to... You have to, f you have to not feel at home in language. So that was the greatest gift. Um, in terms of specific... Um, in terms of specific poetries, actually, probably I would say that um, American poets... I was originally an Americanist. My first degree was in English and American studies, and I started and then um, aborted a, PhD in American poetry. So that was what I was reading. Um, and so, yes, I have read a lot. I started a doctorate in Ezra Pound. I mean, I don't think Pound, I think Pound taught me pretty much everything, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go on with him, as it were. But yes, I think it's mostly, I didn't, I didn't really take to French poetry. I found a lot of it very abstract. I don't know if you find that, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of French poetry is about <laughs> Yeah, a lot of French poetry is about language, you know, it's, or nowadays it is. Something happened, Malarmé happened probably, where suddenly poetry became just another way for language to think about itself. And I find that quite hard to communicate and get excited about. But I'd say American poetry is probably my main, my main influence, yeah. I will, yes, because the book is being published in Romanian next year. And I'm quite frightened, actually. Um, what was very funny, actually, about was I, I did a talk at the Romanian Cultural Centre in London, and um, lots of people were saying that I had hugely exaggerated how much a book rest had been knocked down, which is true, I have. But then this led to the rather strange question about if they ever make a film of it, well, they have to knock down even more of Bucharest <laughs> in order to make it realistic. So I might, in fact, be contributing to the demise of a place I love very much. But, um, yeah, I will go back. I will go back. But there are issues, there are ethical issues about writing so imaginatively, I mean, from the perspective of the imagination rather than imaginatively, about other people's reality. And I'm conscious of those. And I'm sure that when it does come out in Romanian, I will get a pretty rough ride. Richly deserved, I must say. But, uh, yeah, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> yeah, um, as far as Romania goes, when, when were you there? How long were you there? Uh, what, your age, what age periods were you in Romania? I was there from 84. I was there with my parents in 84 and 85. <coughs> <coughs> and I was there by myself between the ages of about 18 and 19, thank you. Um, and I left in very early, 80, in late 87, actually, yeah. And then, uh, can you speak of 
at the time, yeah, I learned enough of the language to get by, and I can still read a bit of it, yeah. 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 Uh, what kind of influence did you are either Romanian poets or writers of influence on you? That's, um, that's a very good question. They were a lot. Um, the people that I knew when I lived there were were poets and writers. Yeah. Um, so of the people I met, uh, Marin Sorescu, who I think is quite well known in in the states, certainly was in Britain. Someone called who he died. Um, Somebody called Mircea Dinescu, who um, became, I think, quite important in the culture ministry um, afterwards, after the revolution. Um, yeah, no, I, I read a lot of contemporary poetry in the original where, where I could. But, you know, the, I mean, what you say about the Romanian poets. What, what I remember about the Romanian poets, what I remember about all the East European poets, is that they found it very hard to get translated into the West, into Western, by Western publishers, because Western publishers wanted them to be dissidents. They wanted them to be in mortal danger for most of their lives before we were in. But as they kept saying, we all want to talk about the same things. Why can't I write a love poem? Why don't you want to translate my poems about, you know, um, my, my, you know, my wonderful parents or my children or my wife. Um, why do I always have to be, before you, Americans, English, French, before you're interested in me, I have to be a dissident poet. And I think they had a point. And, um, one of the things I did, actually, in my last book of poems was invent a Romanian poet through whom I could write normal poems. Um, and he was a way for me to kind of try to express that part of my fundamental belief that people are the same everywhere and they want more or less the same things and that um, you know the, the kind of cultural negotiations they have to go through you know they have to they have to buy an identity or be given an identity as a certain kind of writer before so and so is interested in them it's quite damaging so I, I invented a Romanian poet called Liviu Campanu I translated 12 poems of his origin of his poems uh, 12 pages of his poems when the book came out, they said, yeah, the McGuinness poems, they're okay, take it or leave it. But this Romanian guy is terrific. Uh, we want to see more of him. Um, I, in fact, I even got an invitation from an American university to come and give a talk about Campanu. Um, I wasn't here, but I, I'm, I'm always up to come and talk about Campanu. Um, but that was an odd experience because I imagined myself as a Romanian poet and realized that I would basically be writing the same kind of stuff just with a different name. Um, but some people found that slightly upsetting because they think that when you are writing a poem, you are writing as yourself, whereas when you're writing fiction, your narrator can be anybody. No one ever holds you responsible. Why, I don't know. It does bring a couple of thoughts. I suppose there's the, the tension, the, the linguistic tension between both the poet himself and the reader, the spectator of poetry. And if, there, if in the West you're translating a poet that you would want to to be uh, uh, more political, yeah. you might have a tendency yourself to, if not translate the poem in, in political, you would. poetical terms, you would. You would. You probably would. But you certainly would write about that poem in the context of the political issues. You would. And you could even get that poet in trouble. <laughs> That's true as well, yes. You had to think about that when you were <laughs> translating poets, yeah. There's a question in the back. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's, a really, that's a really interesting question. I mean, <laughs> certainly about, about people like Gaddafi and Ceausescu and so on, they, they began as people that, who looked quite plausible, actually. Um, and they began also with the support of the West. But what happens, I don't know. I suppose the clearest example is... I suppose also there's the idea of the cult of the personality as well, which you've got in Ceausescu. You had it in some communist systems, but by no means all. It's not endemic to communism. It's, it's endemic to certain kinds of totalitarianism. Um, 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it happens. I think it's just a removal from any form of reality because reality, because reality can't be governed. We know that anyway. It needs to be blocked out. Um, and if you find enough people who will help you block it out, as all of these people do, I mean, people like Ceausescu and Gaddafi and so on, they're products, aren't they? They're not just single totalitarian tyrants who spring up fully armed. They're, they're nurtured products, and they might not be deliberately nurtured, but they're made. They're, they're as, you know, they, they're as much the product of their society, perhaps more so than, than, um, than, than it's than its makers, actually. I'm not saying they're victims, but there's something weirdly passive about them. I think it's a strange psychological area. I'm sure that close attention to their attitudes to fashion and clothes and so on. Architecture, I mean, tyranny and architecture, it's an amazing thing. I mean, Hitler did it, Stalin did it, um, Saddam Hussein did it, um, Gaddafi did it, Ceausescu did it, Napoleon III, Napoleon yeah, Mussolini. I mean, architect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think architecture is is a kind of. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but it's implicit. I think in what I was trying to write about. I think architecture is what the is the tyrant's equivalent of what the child does when he's trying to create something out of plasticine and sort of knocks everything down and says, "I'm going to start again." Architects and architecture. Um, that's how these people do it. You know. It's the architectural. There's a character in there who is talking about how dictators have this. And also, they, because they, have, they use architecture, because architecture is the, the most powerful. You don't just need to have the idea. You need to have hundreds of people, hundreds of machines, raw materials. It's the ultimate, it's the ultimate thing. And then the other thing about these people, when they get involved in architecture, as the Ceausescu's did on a, an incredibly kind of ridiculous scale. You know, they come in, they look at the building, a building that had taken three weeks to put up. He said, actually, I don't like that. Can you, can you stick this on it? And he'd draw a little amateur picture. And then you would have 40 fully trained architects come in and say, yeah, I'm sure we can do that for you. And then they go off and do it. Um, I mean, it's whimsical, actually. And there's a character in there who describes it as the, as the whim to power, you know, that you have all this power, but you, you haven't got any, any knowledge to do anything with it. So maybe the answer is in architecture. Um, and as both a professor of literature and a writer and a, a poet, um, what do you think that in English classes, literature classes, what do you do? You think anything is left out? And what is left out? Is there something? Is there? You're talking about. The, is there something that gets lost in the academic study of literature that that is found again or <coughs> in creating literature? I'd, yeah, I mean, I suppose my problem with, with academic writing is that academic writing forgets how to communicate pleasure. Um, I mean, those of us who are academics, <coughs> and we, we, we read books and we teach books, and we do it because we love it, don't we? I mean, the, the, the loss is not between our commitment to our subject or, and our commitment to our students. It's some, sometimes it's in that that you know, most academics, pretty much 98% of the people I know, love the culture that they communicate, they love the books they write about, they love the ideas they deal in, and they have a great deal of affection for the people they're communicating it to. I just think that as a, as a class of person, academics have forgotten how to write, actually. I mean, write for pleasure. And we've, we've also forgotten to teach students how to write for pleasure. Um, I don't know, do you enjoy writing, students? No, no. Isn't it nice to write a good sentence and sit there and look at it and say, well, you know, and, and to try to, to write sentences and, and to be prepared to make mistakes in your sentence. I think the loss comes in there, really. And there's no, there's no contradiction between thinking about stuff and feeling stuff. Sorry. You mentioned the Arab Spring earlier. Um, do you think the uh, you know this revolutionary moment of 2011, you know, with the Occupy movement, the ban on police, and the Arab Spring, uh, from your perspective as you know someone who's, who's, who travels around the world, yeah. who lives a bunch of places, and uh, as a writer and as someone who's experienced firsthand uh, communism, 
Well, um, the first revolution I missed was the uh, Iranian revolution. I was a child in Iran. My, um, the reason I'm obsessed with regime change and revolution was that um, my father was working for the British Council in Iran and um, my sister and mother and I were evacuated and my father was left to work there. Um, working in a British in the British Council and doing the kind of things British people do in revolutions everywhere that is to say they still go to work with their umbrella and their briefcase despite the fact that there are bombs going off to the left and side of them and people strung up from lampposts and things like that and the only way we could get news about what was going on to our fa uh, from our father was actually looking at <coughs> the television news um, so that that was where my kind of interest in these historical moments come from. Um, I was nine, nine, ten, ten. And um, yeah, so I've always been slightly haunted by that, that th these things somehow affected me, but, but also I was not, not involved in them. I don't, um, I don't really know about what happens to, I, I was certainly, I was certainly a very, uh, uh, you know, and remain a very sort of left-leaning socialist liberal, but I don't have any hope that um, I don't really have any hope that protest movements are going to get anywhere. Um, and I last this time last year, I was in Belfast and I went for um, went for a, a few drinks in a pub um, where I met several people, three people in fact, three people who were were Sinn Fein councillors. <coughs> Um, between them, they had done, I think there were three of them, they weren't that much older than me, one of them was considerably younger. I think between them, they'd done about um, 35 years of prison time for various things. And they were extremely developed, intelligent local politicians who believed in their party and believed in the, um, but they also believed in practical politics and they were doing stuff like worrying about things like street lighting and education and so on. But um, I do remember saying to them, you know, why, you know, how do you, how do you think you manage to get all this? And one of them just said outright, you know, it's not pretty and it's not nice, but at some level you have to be prepared to do what we did, which is kill people. Um, and I don't think there's any point in pretending that that isn't um, part of the reason a lot of things get done. It's not nice, but it's probably true. Yes. And I'm just curious to ask, I, I'd like to know this from you. If you were given, I mean, if you were to be born again, would you have chosen to have lived just in one place, or would you? No, no. <laughs> I'd have had nothing to complain about. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I would. No, I can always find something to complain about. No, I wouldn't want anything different. But I mean, that, that idea of loss, it's... The reason it's important, the reason it's really defining is that um, I'm always struck at how few mementos there are of my and my sister's childhood. And the reason for that was that my parents were changing countries every two or three years. So we simply have no, none of, none of our toys, let alone a room to go back to. The only place actually that works as an anchor is my mother's hometown in Belgium, in Bouillon where there is still a small amount. But whenever I want to reconstruct the life that I had, I have to go back there. Um, and my parents were pretty ruthless. I mean, <coughs> I would go back you know, to the new place that they'd moved to and say, you know, where are my, where are my, you know, where are my notebooks of invaluable poems and my favorite trousers? And they said, we had to, we had to lose those. We were, we were traveling light. Um, and so, and so I think that's why I developed, and a lot of people are like this, um, develop a kind of memory that is basically, is basically melancholy. Melancholy is not being able to let stuff go, I think. And yet you would not change it for anything. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, I think I wouldn't change it, no. There are individual parts, a lot of which I would change, but... I wouldn't change the premise, 
of movement. I suppose the other thing is that when you come to a really multicultural society like America, they read poems about displacement. They say, yeah, okay, so what's your problem? What next? <laughs> we've, been, we've been doing this for years. And um, you move from Belgium to England, which is about you know, 150 miles, and you're making a career as a professional, professional nostalgist <laughs> out of it. Um, <coughs> get over it, get a proper job. So I am, I, am, I am conscious that this experience, which in somewhere like Britain or in a really sort of rooted country like Belgium, um, where people don't, you know, a rooted community, I'm, I'm really conscious that it's, it's kind of self-dramatizing to sit and moan about, about loss and all of that kind of stuff. I, no, I, I'm very aware of that. One more question. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Because the way we negotiate time is through place. And we negotiate place through time, don't we? And if we could find a way of matching them together, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be so haunted by both time or place. All right. Um, well, before I, want, before I thank Patrick McGuinness for his wonderful <coughs> reading and uh, generous, uh, generosity with time and place, uh, and answering our questions, I wanted to remind you that his the three books from which he read are available for purchase in the back of the room. Um, he might even be willing to sign copies that are purchased. Yes, yeah. free. Free, no extra charge for the signature. <laughs> so if you're interested, and he's, uh, please help yourself to the food and drink that we have. And thank you all again for coming. It's great. Evening.